The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Unu Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Yes, hello, good evening, and welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, Robert Rosenthal, you can call me Rob, uh, your host, uh, here for episode number eight of All You Can Eat. Coming to you live, live, what is today, the 11th, I want to say? Let me just push a button here and see. Yeah, yeah, April 11th. Coming to you live, April 11th, from um, New York City, New York. Well, I'm happy to report that it appears as if spring has actually sprung after a particularly odd season where we have been moving from, I don't know, temperatures in the 60s to six and a half inches of snow from one day to the next. Very strange. Anyway, it's a lovely day. It's a good time of year. Spring is just... Spring is beautiful. I mean, they're all good. I mean, that's... Anyway... That's kind of really besides the point. The point is that um, I'm going solo tonight after a couple of weeks of some terrific guests. Uh, last week, uh, we spoke with um, with my friend Anthony Giglio, the wine wise guy from Jersey City, and that was fun. And uh, the week before, we had uh, my friend Gabriella Gershenson, who is uh, easily one of the most uh, talented and prolific writers working in the food uh, journalism today. Coming solo to you tonight, but I am uh, quite enthused to tell you that I do have some guests lined up for the next, uh, say, three, four shows. I got, uh, next week we'll be talking with Joe DiStefano, and Joe's great because Joe also is an expert, and he's an expert in this, in a place called Queens. Now, why does that matter? Queens, New York, incidentally. Because if I asked you, what is the single most diverse restaurant city in America? If you know, you would say, that must be Queens. And the answer is, it is. There's just no place in the United States, and I may be able to take it further than that, but let's just be uh, calm about the whole thing. There's no place with a more diverse uh, restaurant, ethnic offering than Queens, New York. So we got Joe coming up. And then after Joe, I am uh, quite thrilled to be uh, talking with Veronica Chambers. She's amazing. Uh, her name is on, I would say, 31 books, five of which are New York Times bestsellers, uh, one required reading for women and girls, uh, and and then two with uh, with uh, author with uh, Famous chefs, uh, Eric Repair, she wrote a book with. She wrote one with Marcus Samuelson, so we'll have Veronica on in a couple of weeks. And also my man Coleman Andrews, a uh, nine-time James Beard Award winner, um, maybe the most kind of knowledgeable uh, guy in, in the world of food uh, today. He's written about food from all over the world, Spain and, and England and here in America, he's uh, founding editor of Savoir Magazine. He actually runs uh, the entire operation uh, these days over at uh, the Daily Meal, which is a super mega site for food and wine. So we'll have Coleman on in a couple of weeks. Exciting. And uh, as far as tonight, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, and I will offer you this. If you're interested, there's a call-in number. I can't promise uh, that I can pick it up. I can't promise the technical technological uh, capacity of the system, but maybe it works. In which case, it's 800-508-5431. That's 800-508-5431. If you want to try calling in, I will try answering it. Now, the theme tonight is Mexico. Mexico the place, Mexico the food, Mexico the beverage, and the reason for that is because yesterday, what is today, Wednesday, Monday night, I got back into the United States of America 
uh, from uh, after having spent five days in Mexico. I was there for um, a wedding. What they call these days the destination wedding. Yes, in which in fact my niece was the uh, was the person uh, getting married. Um, love. I mean, the first of all, the the affair was just fantastic. It took place at a resort in uh, Cancun. A little shout out to first of all um, uh, Nikki and uh, Ryan on their wedding. I should point out, by the way, that I actually officiated the wedding. I can do that. I can do that because I am both uh, ordained by the Universal Life Church, which I will um, point out, uh, I'm glad to say, accepts um, credit cards. And uh, moreover, and equally or more important even in some ways, I'm licensed by the city of New York to perform marriage ceremonies. And so there I went to uh, Cancun, where every day was 85 and sunny. I mean, you just can't ask for better than that. And performed the ceremony, and it was just uh, delicious on the beach, and it was fantastic. I have a new best friend, by the way. Some of you may know him. His name is Don Julio, but uh, we're on a first-name basis right now, so I call him Don. We're going to talk about Don later, but first I want to say that even... Just getting to Cancun was interesting in this way. I am not a, a huge uh, United uh, Airlines uh, flyer. Uh, most of my miles going back many, many years uh, are with uh, American. I think I have these days close to 3 million uh, frequent flyer miles that I have flown on American Airlines, hopping back and forth to uh, mostly to South America. But I'm flying a United uh, last uh, Wednesday night uh, to Cancun. And I'm flying out of Newark Airport, Newark Terminal C. Now, for those who don't know, um, Terminal C at Newark Airport is arguably the single best food and beverage airport scene in America these days. And the reason for that is because United invested what appears to be well over $100 million uh, with a company called OTG, which does this thing, which does airport hospitality around the country. And they produced what, what I call, and I've written about it, which is kind of the benchmark of airport hospitality. And, and anywhere you go in United Terminal C, you're going to find something fantastic to eat and drink. I mean, it's impressive. They're flying in, uh, you know, fish from the Tsukiji uh, fish market in... Um, in Tokyo, they're making everything on premise. I mean, there's wood-burning fire in the place. Let's just put it this way. Most airports that you go to are not making all the food right there on premises. They do this here at Terminal 3 in, in Newark, and and they do it well. And, and they have, a, like, a ton of restaurants, and many of them are associated with kind of celebrity chefs. So, you know, you're going to have your burger place, and you're going to have your Italian place, and... There's wine bars, and then the, I mean, and then there's a place that just does like daily, you know, whatever's coming in from the market that day. It's just really unbelievably super impressive, just just great. And by the way, there are other there are other really good, you know, airport kind of dining destinations. I mean, Austin, Texas is good. Seattle, you're going to get some good fish. Chicago's going to have like, you know, Frontera. I mean, there's plenty of there's like a lot of good. So, up, you know, airport dining and hospitality has been seriously upgraded of late, but, I don't, you know, to me, there's nothing better than Newark. So, you know, it's gotten to the point where it's like, I'm happy to actually fly out of Newark on U United because, you know, you want to get there, you know, you're going, for, I'm going international, so you want to get a little bit early. Well, and there's plenty of places to go. I go to a place out there, it's called Saison, S-A-I-S-O-N, I... I like what they're doing. I like the food. I like the bartender, Raul. And um, and it turns out that the flight is delayed, right? So that one hour wait that I might um, normally have then turns into two hours and then turns into three hours. Let me just put it this way. I'm there with my uh, with my own wife on the way to the wedding. And we like sitting at the at the bar. And this particular bar at Saison is lovely because it's not just like you're sitting at some bar. I mean, it's like, a, you know. People are eating, and there's a raw bar, and so, you know, you want to have oysters, and you want to have, you know, uh, seafood, and anything you want to eat up there. I mean, the guy next to me is having that French dip sandwich, which I've had before, and it's great. 
but I'm not unhappy. And frankly, I don't even mind that the flight is delayed. First it's an hour, then it's two, and finally it's three hours. Let me just put it to you this way. I remember the first drink because Raul said, what are you having? And I said, I'm going to have a martini, but I like a gin martini and make it, um, make it uh, dry and straight up. I like olives in a twist because I like to eat when I drink. And so he makes me that, and uh, that's good. And it goes down easy. But here's the thing that I would like to say about the gin martini. Everybody has like a uh, an alcohol that they think is maybe stronger than others. Than others. I, I don't know if it's true or not. I mean, you, you know, eighty proof is eighty proof. But I don't know. I you know, the people will tell you that like, oh no, tequila really does this to me, or I can't believe it when I have this. My, my um, experience with gin is that it's hallucinogenic. So, I'm fine to have the one, but the general rule for me on a gin martini is just, you know, don't have the second. In fact, uh, back in the 30s, uh, here in, uh, in New York, at the Algonquin Hotel, was a meeting of all of the uh, kind of cool people of the day, writers and, and artists, at the round table at the Algonquin one of those was a woman named Dorothy Parker, sophisticated, wit, brilliant writer, author. And I'll never forget the uh, poem that Dorothy Parker uh, wrote. She said, I like a good martini, two at the very most. After three, I'm under the table. After four, I'm under the host. And the point of the story is very simply this, that like one martini, if you're going to have gin, is good. Two, you're starting to get a little loopy. And I don't mean a vodka martini. I could have a bunch of those. I, I am uh, not a small person. Uh, I'm in the neighborhood of your six uh, one. I'm carrying a minimum of two hundred pounds, so I could I could drink. I could drink twice as much as someone who's five four and weighs hundred pounds. Let's put it that way. And further to that, I eat like a mother. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like I'm pounding food generally all the time. So the combination of being that size and having that amount of food makes it uneasy, if you will, to get kind of like stupid and to get drunk. And yet, uh, with a three-hour delay, <laughs> there at the Newark Airport, friendly bartender Raul over at Saison, here's what I remember. I remember that first martini. That went down well. I traded it for a different kind of martini on the second one, what I call the um, the Vesper martini. Just love those. Vodka and gin. And rather than um, the mousse, it's got uh, roulette. Slightly um, sweet product anyway. I had one of those. I love that. That goes, and by the way, those that goes down really easy. We ordered some food. It was grilled octopus served with a romesco. It was delicious, but had some French fries on the side. We're happy. That's all we ate. And by the way, I mean, for what it's worth, I don't want to start making excuses, but I did not have lunch that day, so I was hungry. And then I had another uh, one of those Vesper martinis, because um, it's three hours, for God's sake. I don't remember if I had any more than that at that particular place. I do remember that it was time eventually to just leave. <laughs> I remember everything. I remember the tip that I left for, I handed it to him. Like, so I'm totally coherent. And then we uh, make our way to the gate here at the Newark Terminal 3, passing a number of lovely kind of eating and drinking establishments. We have some time to kill, I think. So we sit down at a place that's doing like uh, Middle Eastern, Lebanese, because I remember having some baba ganoush and uh, some pita. I wanted some, you know, my body was going, we should probably put some filler in here. I think the mistake I made was when I ordered that that uh, hard cider. Because there's something, you know, about the bubbles in, in a thing that seems to accelerate the the uh, the capacity of the, um, of the gin and, and the vodka that was inside me as well. So I remember all of that. And here's the other thing I remember. I remember we walked to the gate. Now remember, the flight is three hours late. Normally on a flight that's three hours late, people are just like, I mean, they can't wait to get on the plane, so they're just lined up a thousand deep 
You could be in, 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 in group seven and be standing there and thinking you're going to get on with the people in first class. That's what happens. The longer that you delay, the more people stand on a line desperate to get on the plane. We stroll down to the gate 126 or whatever it is, and there's, there's, no, there's nobody waiting to get on the plane. We just strolled on to the plane. Here, here's your boarding pass, which... I don't know, it's probably, I don't know if it was paper or it was on my phone. That part I kind of forgot. I just remember we strolled onto the plane. Everybody's already seated. So that, that should be an indication. But here's the good news. I also remember that I'm sitting on the aisle and the two seats next to me empty. And then on the other aisle is seated my wife, two seats next to her empty. And then I remember this. My wife looked at me and she said, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> I said, yeah, why? She goes, you, you know, you, you're drunk. Well, no, I. there's no question that I am, but I'm okay. Well, she looks at me and she says, do, do you want to get off the plane? <laughs> and I'm laughing because I kind of, you know, I, no, I don't. I'm fine. I don't want to get off the plane. I'm good. Let's just, you know, it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night with, with three hours late. Let's just go. It's fine. And then the last thing I remember was that I was able to, when the plane took off, lay down because I had the three seats. And the next thing that I remember was the announcement that said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, put on your seat belts and put up your, uh, you know, your, your seat back and put up your tray table. We're about to land. That flight is anywhere between three and a half and four hours. I missed that. And I am happy to say that I missed that. But it's, uh, really the good news here is that um, I left the plane feeling pretty good and I felt good the next morning. So there you go. I mean, uh, I'm not proposing... Uh, that uh, you consume in quantity the same way that I did. Uh, I'm not accustomed to uh, to getting kind of loopy in that way, as I said, because I'm big and I eat a lot. Uh, but anyway, I did miss the flight, if you will, in the sense that I was out cold until it was time to land. So there's that. And I guess if there's any uh, punchline to the story, if ever you're going to be a delayed... If ever you're going to be delayed on the flight, there's no better place to get to, to be delayed than at the Newark Terminal 3. Because you've got a lot of options there. Just uh, stay away from Saison and Raul and Gin Martinis. So now um, I'm in Cancun. And as if I didn't have enough to drink, it's, uh, it's the heartland of tequila, obviously. As I said, my new best friend, Don Julio. Hey, Don and I on a first-name basis. Those of you who aren't familiar, Don Julio is tequila. And um, I used to spend a lot of time in Mexico City for my days in the advertising business. I've been to Mexico conservatively 20 times, maybe 25, doesn't matter. I've been there a lot. And I had a partner in Mexico City. Jose Alberto Teran, Don Jose, and he turned me on to something, I'm going back to 1995, it was called Sangrita, and Sangrita is not Sangria, in fact it has nothing to do with wine, and it has no alcohol in it, Sangrita is a, a juice concoction that's made up of a combination of uh, tomato juice, lime juice, uh, some hot sauce, um, so it's citrusy, it's tomatoey, it's a little spicy, and it's it's used as the chaser, if you will, for uh, tequila. So you have them together. You would have, for example, a sip of uh, tequila and a sip of sangrita. And um, to me, and he turned me also on to Don Julio. And we'll talk a little bit about tequila. There's, there's more than one kind. I am a fan of the Reposado which is uh, your aged, rested um, tequila. Just a lovely product, and a little sip of that, and a little sip of the sangrita. And by the way, I should also point out that he, uh, he being um, Jose Teran, also took me in those days, it's actually still open, a restaurant called Casa Bell, B-E-L-L. -L. Um, Casa Bell, man, in Mexico City, it's still in business, and I will tell you that of the 3,000 meals at restaurants that I've had on six continents, that shows up, Casa Bell, is one of my top ten most memorable because you walk into Casa Bell 
and it's set up in such a way that you really kind of back outside because on beautiful days it's just like they open it up and so you're sitting inside but you're looking up at the sky and the first thing you do when you get to Casa Bell is you order some Don Julio Reposado and, uh, and some Grita have a little sip of each they don't um, as they do here in America, they don't bring a bunch of chips and salsa to the table. That's like an American concept. Um, but on the appetizer menu is a dish called Pato Bell, uh, which is kind of like almost a takeoff, if you will, like Taco Bell. Anyway, the point is Pato is duck. And so we would sit down for the tequila and the um, sangrita. And by the way, I mean, sangria is just great on its I mean, I wouldn't drink it on its own. I'm not a, like a huge tomato juice kind of lover. But like with anything else, when it's made with fresh ingredients, like fresh squeezed, you know, tomato juice, fresh squeezed lime, a little bit of hot sauce and, what, and whatever else they put in there. Man, it's just beautiful. And you're sipping. And, and so uh, Jose orders Pato Bell. And what comes to the table, two things uh, or three come to the table. One is roasted shredded duck which on its own is killer. It's just, I can kind of taste it. I mean, it's like, first of all, duck is just, I don't know why we're not eating more duck in this country or rabbit. It makes no sense to me. Duck is just brilliant. And when you roast it slowly and you shred it, it's magnificent. And it comes to the table with, um, with fresh, warm, handmade uh, tortillas, small could be uh, flour, could be corn. I think corn. And into the uh, tortilla goes um, goes shredded roasted duck, and a little bit of kind of like chopped onion, like maybe pickled, maybe not. Like just chopped onion. Maybe it has a touch of cilantro. And I remember Jose would always squeeze in a little bit of fresh uh, lime. And if they didn't serve me anything else. At Casa Bell, other than tequila, reposado de Julio, sangrita, and pato bell, roasted duck inside warm, soft uh, tortillas with a little bit of onion and cilantro and a squeeze. Of, maybe you put a little shot of hot sauce in there. I mean, that is just glorious eating. God bless. Place is still in business. So, we're in Cancun, and, you know, let's just. While we're on the subject of tequila, um, what's to know about tequila is that it should be like real tequila is 100%, you know, agave. If you're having stuff that's not, I'm not saying that the stuff that you're having that doesn't, it's not 100%, but don't, I wouldn't bother with it. You want tequila, you're going to be drinking 100% blue agave. And then there are varieties. Someone will tell you that there are five, but there are really three kind of at the end of the day that, that, that matter. You have your Blanco, you know, and it's just kind of the, it's the freshest kind of purest form of tequila. It's, it's distilled. It's no aging, right? So it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's lovely. It's pure. And, it's, and, and frankly, if you're going to make a, you know, a margarita, you, you should, you know, use a, use a nice Blanco. It's no problem. Then you have the reposado, which which is my favorite. I like the reposados. They're aged uh, two months to a year. They're aged in oak. Um, and when you give it that little bit of aging, it puts a little, it makes it, you know, it rounds out the flavor a little bit. It softens it a bit. I just love it. And then, and I got no problem with Añejo. Añejo is the one that's uh, your most aged. You'll see that it's uh, darker. It's uh, browner one to three years in oak. And again, I, people who think that you shoot tequila, I'm not a tequila shooter. I'm a sipper. And so I'm going to sip a reposado and I'm going to sip a, um, I'm going to sip an añejo. And the longer it ages and the more kind of lovely that flavor gets, because it's been made from agave, right? It has like a natural kind of like, I'm not going to say sweetness, but you get, um, you, you get some kind of like vanilla texture, you get some floral, and it's great. And yes, are there are there tequilas that go like extra on Yeho and extra age? Sure, get them. Spend a fortune for them if you want. But the point of the story is tequila's all good. And so is mezcal, which also comes from uh, the agave plant. 
uh, and yet they're different. Uh, they're different. Why? Because even though they both, well, first of all, they're produced in essentially different states of Mexico. Mexico has 31 states. Tequila, I think, in addition to Jalisco, there's a few others. It's like four or five places that you can actually, you know, make and call tequila, tequila. Mezcal is coming from different parts of the country, so that's number one difference. The second thing is that tequila is really only made with the, with the blue agave, right? So it's made with one type, one, one variety of the agave. Mezcal can be made with like, and, and it is made with like 30 different varieties of agave, even though like there are five or six that are principal to it. And then the way that it's made, the, produ the, the production process um, of, the, um, of the agave is different from the tequila. And I learned about it. And, one of the th and I learned about it there from someone that was making it. And I was blown away by how sophisticated the method is for making the agave. I, and and uh, what's, what's impressive is not only that it's a more sophisticated method for producing a spirit than almost any other that I've ever heard of, but they've been doing that way for thousands of years. I mean, you got to you got to hand it to Mexico. Mexico has been like you you can go back thousands of years and find some of the very same uh, elements, techniques and ingredients that that are now in use. I mean, it's funny to be in Cancun because the truth of the matter is Cancun is not really like the rest of Mexico. I mean, it's like 50 years old. And I give them credit for building it. Uh, and it's lovely and the water is warm, and the sun is bright, and, you know, but you you go in there for, you know, to hang out by the pool and drink, you know, margaritas, that's fine. But the rest of Mexico, man, you're going to see some really, like, one of the most sophisticated cuisines in the world that goes back thousands of years. Anyway, to make mezcal, which is becoming, like, super popular, I'm sure it's just a matter of time before we figure out how to generate an agave shortage because it's also made with agave. They extract the um, the heart of the agave to make um, to make mezcal and they cook it and they cook it underground like in these pit ovens and they put earth over it and 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 they put it you know it's over pits of like hot rocks and and, and it's cooked for like days and that's why when you do that kind of underground roasting it, it, in, it first of all it caramelizes um, the root of the agave, and some of you know that like agave can also be used to make agave syrup, which is totally sweet. So anyway, when you you know cook this stuff underground for for three days, the roasting it brings out like a whole lot of um, not only caramelization but flavor, and the flavors like just range from any like the, the flavors are all over the place, but they're intense. They're distinctive, and they're oftentimes smoky. They don't have to be, but generally speaking, um, it, cre it, it creates kind of this beautiful, you know, smokiness. And then they crush, they crush this cooked, you know, agave root. Oftentimes, it, you know, like, in, I don't know, they probably still use like a steel wheel and horses and whatever. And then they leave it to ferment in like large you know, vats or barrels with some water added. They take the the mash kind of ferments and, and then they take the, the liquid and they distill it in like clay or copper pots and it's generally done in small batches. And it's an unbelievable product. Now again, if you're the kind of person that goes, I don't really go for, you know, smokiness or that kind of thing, you may not like it. Um, it, it has an intensity to it, but if, if you like tequila, it's just a matter of time before you try mezcal. And one of the things I'll tell you about mezcal is what they say down in Mexico. Para todo mal mezcal y para todo bien también. For everything bad, mezcal, and for everything good as well. So count me in on the mezcal. By the way, the guy that taught me about the production process runs a company down there. He is a very impressive dude, uh, and he makes <coughs> an agave, excuse me, called... Monte Lobos. Mm. Just taking a sip of something. Unfortunately, it's water. Because really, I should be sipping tequila at this point. So here are three brands of um, of agave of of um, 
of mezcal that I really like. One is Monte Lobos. Super sophisticated stuff. I just really like it. It's just, again, it's a sipping thing. You're not going to find, you know, worms in the thing. That's just stupid. You can also find uh, another brand called Del Maguey, Maguey, M-A-G-U-E-Y. That's good. I also like Vida. Um, but anyway, mezcal, worth a try. <clears throat> On the subject of Mexico, I know that we're like, maybe three weeks from Cinco de Mayo, but I feel like it's not too early to start thinking about it, <clears throat> especially since I'm just back from Mexico. Viva Mexico. I want to tell you something. In addition to the sophistication of the cuisine in that country, um, you know, there, let me tell you the top ten things that came that originally came from Mexico. Are you ready for this? Chocolate. C. Chocolate comes from Mexico. Cacao. They figured out how to turn cacao beans into chocolate. Avocados. Mexico. Chilies. Mexico. Peanuts. Cacahuates. Come from Mexico. Tomatoes. Mexico. Vanilla. Originally Mexico. And of course, tequila, mezcal, and Carlos Santana. So there. You've got ten things that show up from that place. So, there you go. There's a lot of good coming out of Mexico, including Carlos Santana. Let's talk about guacamole. And, and here's why. Because guacamole is awesome. And I think really, I don't remember any, like I can't remember people going, I don't like guacamole. I know there are people who genetically can't fathom, can't handle cilantro, and that's fine. You don't have to if you don't uh, want to, if you can't Stand cilantro, you can still have guacamole. Point I want to make about guacamole is that you should make your own. Because guacamole is always going to be better when you make it than when you buy it already made. Like, so you either make it or you go to one of those Mexican restaurants where they make it table side. I was fortunate on one of my trips to Mexico to meet a chef by the name of Betty Vasquez. I love Betty. Betty uh, owns and runs a hotel called the Hotel Garza Canela. It's in a place called San Blas. San Blas is on the Riviera Nayarit, on the Riviera Nayarit, which is um, about 110 miles. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to have some more water here. Stay with me. Mm -hmm. ah, man. See, that's the thing. It would have been so much better with tequila. San Blas is on the Riviera Nayarit, um, which is on the Pacific coast of Mexico. It's 110 miles of coast in Mexico. So remember I said there are 31 states in Mexico? One of those is the state of Nayarit. And Betty is a, like, a super gifted chef who trained in Europe, you know, around the world with, like, serious chefs and yet is most proud of bringing her learning back home and, and, in, and informing her local Mexican cuisine with it. And Betty also, you know, if you turn on, like, I don't know what show she's on. I don't know if it's top show. Whatever show she's on, she's, like, very well known. Great chef, great person. Runs the Hotel uh, Garza Canela on Nayarit, which is, honestly, it's my favorite, my favorite part of, of Mexico. And if you end up going there, by the way, a lot of people go to San Blas. Like, the hotel is not, you know, you're not going to confuse it with, um, with some five-star Ritz-Carlton. You know, it's, um, it's laid back. <clears throat> it's cash. It ain't fancy, but it's in San Blas, number one. And number two, Betty's cooking. The thing about San Blas is that if you're into birds, like, San Blas is one of the great bird sanctuaries in the world. It's just an amazing, I'm not a bird guy, but... You go out on a boat in San Blas, and you're just blown away by what nature brings to that place. Then you go back, you have a little uh, reposado and sangrita, and then Betty will cook some stuff, including guacamole. And I said to Betty, tell me about guacamole, and she looked at me and she said, uh, never tomatoes. I never forgot that. Guacamole is all about the avocado. So the inclusion of tomatoes in it is... Um, 
arbitrary, uh, capricious, uh, unnecessary. Well, uh, choose your adjective. She doesn't put tomatoes in uh, in guacamole, and neither do I. I have a recipe for guacamole. You can find a recipe anywhere. It's not complicated. I happen to have one in my in my cookbook. It's one of the hundred recipes in the book for guacamole. There are two other guacamole recipes in my book. I realize too, by the way, guacamole toast. You know, I mean, you know, you don't have to be a genius to figure that one out. Uh, I mean, avocado toast, and then you have guacamole, and then I did a salad. I remember in the book also uh, guacamole and grapefruit salad because it's it's that juxtaposition between kind of the sweet and creamy and then the uh, the acidic and the juicy. Oh, that's freaking lovely. Anyway, short order, Dad, One Guy's Guide to Making Food Fun and Hassle-Free, if you want to get my guacamole uh, uh, recipe. But again, it's not complicated. The most important thing is your avocado. Uh, we use the Haas avocados, which are going to come out of Mexico or California. We use them when they're perfectly ripe. If you have trouble ascertaining when they're perfectly ripe, Ask somebody at the supermarket to give them to you when they're perfectly ripe. They will not be hard. They will not be too hard. They will not be too soft. They will be, they will yield to the touch and they will be awesome. I will tell you that as the guy who is the Costco ho, they're also sold by the six pack over at the Costco. The only problem with them over at the Costco, where you'll pay or six, what you would normally pay for one or two in your supermarket. The only problem with the six avocados at Costco, which come to you hard as a freaking rock, is that all six ripen at the precise moment, which means at the exact same moment, which means that you kind of almost have to make guacamole. And by the way, here's another thing I should point out to you. No, no kidding. When those things are ripe, stick them in the fridge. You'll keep them longer, right? So, anyway, there's that. Now, I'd like to tell you an avocado joke, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the avocado joke. It goes like this. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Eat me now. Too late. Signed, avocados. Yeah, they go from being, like, perfect to dead quickly. Recipe is in my book. It's basically perfectly ripe avocados, you're going to put in a little bit of chopped up uh, red onion. Thick with onion, by the way, if you want to make it less bitter, is to, you know, run it under some water. I don't use a lot of onion, you know, depending on how many avocados I got in there. It's a teaspoon, it's a tablespoon, whatever. You're going to have in uh, some uh, chili pepper. Most people use jalapeno. I prefer serrano. Either one will work. Diced. You're going to put in um, cilantro in my book um, into your guacamole, again, to taste. You're going to put in lime juice, again, to taste. You're going to use salt. To me, there is one optional ingredient. I know a lot of people like to throw stuff in, whether it's tomatoes or dried stuff. No. To me, the one optional ingredient is a little bit of crushed garlic. I, I actually do put one clove worth of um, super crushed garlic in there. And then mash with, uh, you know, either a couple of forks or one of those, uh, what do you call, uh, potato masher things. God, it's just beautiful. So uh, we had a lot of guacamole there, like a ton of a really good guacamole. Really, really good guacamole. Um, and, of course, the best way to eat that is with chips. So to your chips. I have a weakness. I'm going to be the first to admit it. I have um, a, a, a chip problem, if you will. Um, an addiction, if there's any food that I can eat kind of mindlessly, obsessively, I need help, it's uh, tortilla chips with a, uh, with, a, with a tomato salsa, a pico de gallo, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's a problem. I, I've said it before, I will say it again, if there's a 12-step program for tortilla chips and uh, salsa, hello, my name is Rob. And I also had on this trip, I was uh, thrilled that in addition to some excellent tortilla chips, which uh, were served with the guacamole, they were serving chips called totopos, T-O-T-O-P-O-S. Totopos are also a corn product. They are also uh, triangulated, if you will. 
Um, they are similar to a tortilla in that way, but they're different. You can toast them, fry them, bake them. They're kind of a little bit more flat y if you will, at least the ones I had. They were a little bit more chewy, so instead of being like an in the intense crunch of the deep-fried chip, these have a little bit more of a chew to them. My God, they are so great. Just great. Serve those with uh, your guacamole. And also, I'll tell you what else I had a lot of while I was there. And this is great, too, because if you're like into clean eating, you cannot go wrong with ceviche. Where um, fish and seafood is actually cooked with, uh, like, lime juice. You know what I mean? And some lemon juice and some onion and some chili pepper. So it's served room temperature or cold. Um, but it's been marinating, and it, it actually kind of cooks, if you will, in the in the citrus of the of the lemon and lime. Now, here's the thing: I I think that having been to Mexico, specifically Cancun, in the past, and making the mistake of ordering ceviche, which was served raw, I wasn't hospitalized because the doctor ended up coming to the um, to the room at two thirty in the morning to inject me with painkillers. In this case, however, which is to say this past weekend, I went to the ceviche and could not help but notice that the fish was, uh, and the seafood, like the shrimp, were a little bit more, they, they were a little cooked, let's put it that way. They weren't serving, like, just absolutely raw stuff. But ceviche is a beautiful thing for those of us that want to eat the clean, because you're having fish, you're having seafood, you're having lemon and lime, onion and chili pepper, super flavor. N not really any fat to speak of. Um, great tasting food and kind of clean. Love that. Until, of course, you have 10,000 uh, tortilla chips or totopos with it. And then, like, uh, maybe a pound or two of guacamole. Here's another food from Mexico that I had, again, every day that I could, there was a breakfast served, and in every breakfast that is served, they serve something called chilaquiles. And chilaquil chilaquiles um, are magnificent. Magnificent. Um, the taste, the texture, the sauce, let's just talk a little bit about, ch about chilaquiles, because what you have here is fresh fried tortilla chips. And we'll talk about the texture in a minute because they're not like, oh, you know, super crunchy in your mouth because they have been cooked together with sauce. The sauce can be green or red. If it's going to be green, it's because you, um, you're you having like a, uh, a, a salsa verde, right? The green sauce is made with tomatillos, and some, uh, you know, serrano or jalapeno chilies, a bunch of uh, cilantro, you have some salt. And some of the oil that those uh, tortilla chips were, were fried in. If you go red sauce, because that's the option, your salsa roja is made with some Roma tomatoes and some onion and garlic and, and then a couple of different types of chilies, depending on the level of heat, could be cascabels. Chili de arbol, which are a little bit uh, more intense, a little bit spicy. Guajillos, some salt, a little sugar, and again, some of the oil. So you can go with the green sauce, a salsa verde, again, and it's cooked, by the way. It's, all this stuff is like blended and cooked. You can go with the red sauce, all those ingredients I mentioned, blended and cooked. And the sauce gets fried up with your uh, tortilla chips. And then on top of it go your fried eggs. Um, you can do scrambled. I just love the breaking of the yolk on top of this red or green sauce with these semi-hard, semi-soft, hot tortilla chips. And then what else comes with it? Well, the normal accompaniments uh, for a um, chilaquiles are going to be a little bit of uh, onion, and, you know, they like to serve, the, you could go, like, raw onion, but they don't mind doing, like, pickled onions over there. And you'll also see the Mexican crema, which is like a, um, I guess you would call it like a, uh, like a sour cream. Fantastic. And you'll also see cheese. I don't mean melty cheese. I mean the cotija, the Mexican cheese. It's like crumbly, right? 
So you have this plate that has these um, beautiful, perfect little uh, chips that are mixed with either this beautiful red sauce or vibrant green sauce, on top of which you put a couple of fried eggs, a little bit of sour, uh, that Mexican crema, a little bit of onion, and a little bit of that cotija. And I know that I'm having it for breakfast because it's got the fried eggs on it, but I'm telling you something, I would have it for lunch. And I'm looking at pictures of it. I would have it right now because I'm starving. And literally the sound of it has made me salivate. Every day I had chilaquiles. Really, that was one of the, the best things that I ate in, in, in Mexico. Love that. Um, I skipped the chapulines, which... Uh, if you don't know, are those little fried grasshoppers. I've had them before. I am not afraid of the, um, of the grasshoppers. They're, um, if you don't kind of look at them, <laughs> I guess it's kind of hard, because they, they, they look like, you know, giant fried grasshoppers. They taste good. They're crunchy, and they're lovely. And you put them inside, again, the same thing as you were doing with the duck. You put them inside, and you roll them up, and you give a little shot of this and that, and it's, it's lovely. I didn't have them, but it, it does raise um, the, um, the question that I wanted to cover next in our remaining time, which is, what's the food that you just can't take? And, and I, like, it's a natural segue, because I can understand, like, for me, th there are so few foods that I won't eat, but I could certainly understand how people don't get excited about eating fried grasshoppers. Right? I mean, I, I get it. That said, I'm happy to eat the chicken heart. I got no problem with brains. I'll eat the pancreas. Give me some octopus. Sea urchin, you know, gives me a, a sexual pleasure. I, I, I'm just saying, there's a lot of stuff. So there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a forum online that occasionally I tune into, and I see some stuff like, uh, you know, what's the one food that you can't take? Let me just... Then I read some of the comments, because I'm always surprised at, like, what people, you know, don't like. And it opens right up with okra. I, I'll eat okra. I get that it's slimy, but I don't, I don't mind that. And in fact, I'm, I'll be back in New Orleans next month, and there's going to be some okra somewhere along the way. I don't have a problem with okra. But people basically... Like, when I go up and down this list, I'll see things and I go, how could you not? I, okra, okay, I get it. It's a textural issue. That's what happens with food. You either can't tolerate the taste or you can't tolerate the texture. That's what I'm going to tell you. This guy writes, what's the one food you can't, is it, what food can't you take? Okra. He, and he comments, that's snot in a pod. That's how he describes it. Somebody else says shrimp, which makes no sense because it's easily, I, I mean, whatever, it's one of the great, you know, to me, it's one of my favorite foods in the whole world. Shredded coconut makes no sense to me. Again, love that. Uh, cream of wheat, interesting. Um, and wheat, wheatina. Now, I grew up on, on farina and wheatina, but I, like, my own mother can't, like, gets, no, is nauseated by the idea of eating, like, that texture, you know, that, the texture of, like, that, that soft, you know, wheatina, farina type texture. Cottage cheese. I'm looking at what people can eat. Kidney beans. Skin is too tough or too thick. I don't. It's more the texture. Yeah, texture. That's right. Okay, you don't need eggs. That's your problem. Peaches and fruit cocktail. Really. Um, Italian sausages. The licorice flavor makes me sick. Says somebody. It's exactly the licorice flavor. Why I like Italian sausage, but of course you can buy it without that. Mushrooms can't stand the texture. There's okra again. There's somebody with beets, tomatoes, mushrooms, cantaloupe. Really. Um, is there anything else here that's even easy? Oh, peas are nasty? I don't think so. I got no problem with peas. Eggs, mushrooms, garlic, overripe. Oh, liver. Yeah, well, there you go. I love liver. The problem with liver is that people overcook it, and it tastes exactly like liver. You don't really want that. Um, so <laughs> soggy bread makes me dry heave. Really? Anyway, all right, so that was um, that. But then once I saw that, I um, went to another place. And I see um, something, another kind of form for what drink made you never want to drink again. Now, coming out of my um, airport experience in Newark, uh, followed by uh, the Tequila Weekend, this was interesting to me. Because I think anybody who drinks has had something 
has had an occasion where they've had too much of something and they make that promise and never going to drink again. So then, of course, you drink the next day. You just may not have that. I know what mine was. In college, uh, my girlfriend and I at the time stayed for a summer semester. We went out one night to the local bar. We drank rusty na I drank rusty nails. Now, for the life of me, it's the only time in my life that I ever had it. I never had it prior to that. I don't. I did not drink scotch then. And the rusty nail is made with uh, scotch and drambuie. And drambuie is like a scotch liqueur. It's essentially scotch with like honey. And I had, I don't know how many I had. But I know that I had two for sure at least. And I know that I spent the night sleeping on the toilet. And I don't like scotch. I don't mind the smell now. I don't drink it. I just don't. Honestly, I just, that was my thing. Everybody has it. A lot of people have tequila issues. Some people, you know, it's going to be gin. I get that. Because that is a hallucinogen. I don't care what anybody says. So let's uh, take a look at what some people said about what drink made you never want to drink again. And there it goes. If it happens, I will let you know. Very funny. Uh, the time I did a shot of Jägermeister. Okay. All of them. Sober 11 years. Crown Royal was my passion. Cuervo Gold. 15 years ago. Still can't smell it. And I get that. That's one of those things. Kettle 1 Vodka. It's like drinking turpentine. Of course, I was drinking again the next day. No, it's not like drinking turpentine. Sorry. Harvey Wallbanger. <laughs> Remember those? Let's see, orange juice, Galliano, and vodka. Yeah, anything, you know, these sweet drinks will kill you. That's the problem. Here's somebody that says Coors Light. A caipirinha, I hate it. That is so wrong because I love a caipirinha, which is what you get down in Brazil, uh, made with cachaça, lime juice, and sugar. And I'll tell you something, man. Those things go down smoother than a baby's ass on a water slide. Uh, I call them liquid love, and I like a good caipirinha, but I could see where, again, because of the combination of the sweet with the cheap alcohol, they could kill you. Peppermint schnapps. A fifth of tequila between me and my sister-in-law. We were so sick, my husband had to hose me down in the garage. Hello. Gin, seven, and lemon. Well, that makes no sense to me. Rumple mints, Everclear. Oh, yeah. If you don't know what Everclear is, by the way, I will... Um, Tell you that's what we drank in college. It's a grain alcohol, two hundred proof. It's hundred, you know, it's basically. I don't. Know, it's like you know the kind of stuff that gets distilled in a garbage can. The thing about uh, Everclear or grain alcohol uh, is that when you're having a frat party, for example, and you fill up a giant, uh, you know, garbage tin with uh, Everclear and with some Hawaiian punch and some Seven Up, you know, you know, it goes down easy. Again. It's a problem. It's a mistake. It's the thing that makes you wake up the next morning and go, never again. We, uh, we topped off uh, that, that potent cocktail in school with uh, something that was called uh, Greekers, because right off campus were two hot dog uh, restaurants, if you will, like, like, like counters, really, in these two adjoining places. I think they were called Greekers, not because there was anything remotely Greek about the hot dog, but because the guys who owned the place... Um, we're both Greek, and it was uh, boiled hot dogs, generic boiled hot dogs on a, a hot dog bun that wasn't even toasted. But what made the Greek complete was the Greek's sauce, which was um, like lumpy and unidentifiable, like lumpy, slightly meaty sauce that went over the hot dog. Then you had raw onions and you had cheese, and you you had a package uh, with that. Two of those, please. And a barbecue chips and some uh, chocolate drink. Yoo-hoo. So now you have the combination of being kind of like woos out, woozy, crazy Craig on the Everclear. And you're going to now eat hot dogs with an unidentifiable sauce, onions, cheese, barbecue chips, and chocolate milk. And ladies and gentlemen, there you have in a nutshell the fine dining scene of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um... Finally, tonight, uh, because we have only uh, two or three minutes to go, as the Costco ho, allow me to recommend the following items at Costco. Go in and get yourself a bag of avocados so that you can make guacamole. Remember that six of them will be as hard as a rock. 
they will all ripen at the precise moment. If they also sell nice chips over there at the Costco, like a giant bag of, you know, I mean, if you're going to go store bought, they have they have better than like your supermarket brand. They have like you know organic, stone ground, blah blah blah. They have decent chips over in the place. And uh, you know what else? Um, they do a salsa over there, which is like a peach mango salsa. I think it's made by the company called Santa Barbara. And for a store bought salsa, it's not um, it's not too bad. Again, it's sweet. It's the kind of stuff that you can't have a lot of. But what's beautiful about it is if you don't have it with chips, you know, you can grill yourself a piece of chicken and just finish it with uh, dump a little bit of this peach mango salsa on top. Nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, your avocados, your uh, peach mango salsa, your chips that's over at your uh, Costco, your book, show to the dad. One guy's guide to making food fun and hassle free available for you on Amazon, on Walmart, Barnes & Noble, anywhere you look. Twelve bucks, I'll teach you how to cook and throw a hundred recipes at you. Not a lot of, I don't think I used mayonnaise once. Yeah, maybe in the tuna salad, I don't know. I don't think I deep fried a thing. Um, so it's great that way. And uh, finally, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will say this, that we'll be back next Wednesday at 8 p.m. for All You Can Eat. Next Wednesday, my guest, Joe DiStefano, the foremost expert on the culinary scene in Queens, New York. He's got a book out on it. I mean... They're eating food from about 100 countries out, out in Queens, right over the bridge, right over the bridge from Manhattan or from Brooklyn. I mean, the food scene there is outrageous. We'll be talking to Joe Stefano next week. And then after that, as I mentioned, we'll have Veronica Chambers on the air, on the podcast, that we'll have Coleman Andrews. I will be back with you next uh, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, for episode number nine of All You Can Eat. This is Rob Rosenthal, your host. Remember this, my friends, life is short. So never... Wait, I'm the tip of the pad man. I'm the tip of the pad man. Ain't nothing gonna stick on.